Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Fully recovered after reviewing the Putrid 2018 remake of Suspiria. Let me tell you something. Dakota Johnson got nothing on Jessica Harper. I mean, she just can't match the, the bondability, the skill, the husky voice that she has. Dakota just sounds more like just a porn star. The way she speaks, the way she, the way she acts, the way she's like swerving her body around. I mean, I don't give a shit. Fuck that remake. And I don't care what anybody says. I mean, you like it, fine, but that's not for me. Give me the Dario Gentile horror masterpiece over that. And stay away from me. Okay, okay. But now, I'm finally going to review a more contemporarily vampire film. Going for the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's a very overlooked film called Simply Near Dark. Which was directed by Catherine Bigelow, who also co-wrote with Eric Red. The same man who gave us the original The Hitcher. And he also went on to do Body Parts, Bad Moon. Uh, but also, this was considered to be Bigelow's uh, first solo film. Because she actually had directed a film called The Loveless uh, with William Defoe, But she co-directed that. And... This was, of course, on a small budget of $5 million. Um, being released at the time when, in the late 80s, they were going for a popular trend for vampires. I mean, The Lost Boys came out um, in late summer. That became a mega-sized hit, or sort of. But, of course, when everyone went to see that, I mean, people were just so excited. They, they really enjoy what a vampire film would have been like in, in this whole different time period. Whereas uh, Near Dark was being released uh, with a small distribution, happens to be De Laurentiis Entertainment Group, which has already been, at the time, filing for bankruptcy. Uh, nearly near bankruptcy at this point. Um, because most of the films that they were going to plan to release have been canceled or they had to give it to another distributor to give it. Yeah, I mean, a few of the films had actually gave it to other uh, studios like United Artists, TriStar, um, and sometimes they just release it on their own but under as a direct-to-video release from HBO. Okay, now here's the thing. I have the Blu-ray of the movie, the only copy that I ever got that's now out of print, but I bought it back at Best Buy for a reasonable price at, at $14.99, 15 bucks, but hey, it was worth it. <sighs> Be warned. Lionsgate what would the fuck you were thinking when you came up with this idea? Yep, I know why. Because they're focusing on the trend of all the Twilight sagas that was coming out. I mean, the first movie became such a mega hit that they actually bound to do a sequel, which is, of course, New Moon. And then after that, uh, Eclipse and Breaking Dawn, Parts 1 and 2. <laughs> Oh boy. And we had to go for this dreaded cover art that they chose. That is so not finger licking good. Ugh. Well, on the other hand, it does contain extras. Um, the transfer of the film is not pristine, as you may think. It, it did actually felt it was actually filtered with color grading 
which gives it like a grayish uh, tint um, as you can see because it feels like it's not exactly as bright enough as they were hoping for but it was always been a dark film anyway and that's how we got director of photography Adam Greenberg who actually had worked on the Terminator and he wanted to shoot this uh, exactly how night had to be and he wanted the whole film to be night anyway only gets a little bit of daylight you know during the middle of it and that was the case um, but it desperately needs a 4k remastered if this ever gets a re-release again maybe from Lionsgate through its best drawn collector series uh, label yeah boutique label or perhaps maybe Kino Lober might take a chance out of it I mean I could see that because Kino Lober now has a deal with Studio Canal yeah so at that point on this was a dated master from them dating back to the mid 2000s I mean roughly at the time they released the Anchor Bay to this uh, special edition um, which by the way does contain um, all the other features um, except for the photo gallery and maybe um, the storyboards uh, scripts that they had uh, which I wish they had poured it onto this Blu-ray but what can you do but it did have the deleted scene with commentary by Catherine Bigelow it has living in darkness the making of documentary which features um, most of the cast you know talking about uh, the movie and how they did it you know with practical effects and how they shot it at two locations um, with a little bit of California in there too because they shot it in Arizona and, and Oklahoma which at that point on through its five million dollar budget um, they had to shoot it for like 47 days perhaps and um, also because they had to take a little bit of breaks here because of the uh, the weather conditions Oklahoma was actually raining outside while Arizona was uh, was snowing they had to shoot this in the summer but it was pretty difficult having to get some of the the particular shots exactly how it's supposed to maintain you know, just to tell the story um, but it was great to see the cast uh, at the time I mean I know Bill Paxton passed away in 2017 and, and I know it sucks too but he was great when he got to do the interview uh, joining in with uh, Lance Henderson, Jeanette Goldstein all which were in the movie uh, Aliens and seeing that uh, at the time uh, Catherine Bigelow was um, had a boyfriend of director James Cameron that soon they'd be married um, in 87 but then they or 88 I think yeah it was, I think it was 88 and then later they they got divorced in 91 uh, very short-lived uh, marriage, but hey. <laughs> but hey, I mean, Catherine did a favor for Jim, so he actually had a chance. I mean, because they're perfect. I, I know originally they were going to get uh, Michael Bean to play the part of Jesse Hooker, but he got confused uh, with the script. But Lance apparently just got the role. Perfect. Although I guess at that point on... <laughs> Lance wanted to get um, Paxton's role as Severn because, I mean, this is like a fun character to play who's very psychotic. I mean, he gives a lot of tremendous dialogue and tons of um, one-liners that he's given to, you know, like finger licking good or, <laughs> or at this rate, uh, I'm, Hottie, I'm going to separate your head from your shoulders. Hope you don't mind none. <laughs> or um, quotes like uh, <laughs> I hate them when they ain't been shaved <laughs> or so on and so forth I mean he has like a lot of great lines of dialogue that just totally works anyway and it does contain two trailers for the film uh, probably the most um, gruesome one of them all which actually had a and I'm surprised to find it on YouTube. There was a a very rare uh, 
restricted uh, R rating the red band trailer that they had. Um, I think this one was closer, but it was more a little bit edited on that. Uh, I kind of wish it was included, but hey, better than nothing, I guess. Um, and then they had the second trailer, which features the song by uh, John Parr called Naughty Naughty, which is featured um, at the, the middle of the scene where they went to a local bar. And we know how the fun starts, <laughs> but there's more fun going right to it. <laughs> um, yeah, English 5.1 DTS HD Master Audio. Yep, it sounds so superb. It actually sounds uh, quite excellent when I heard it, because it was... Um, based on the fact that the movie was actually shot in ultra stereo uh, yeah I mean movies that were shot uh, at that time seeing that this was a small budget film yeah they they were going for a very different uh, stereo sound that's more surround sort of almost like uh, almost um, in its pre uh, digital sound age just to make it sound a lot louder but I know some people may get turned off by that not as good as uh, Dolby Stereo, but I think you get the idea. But it does have the English 2.0 PCM audio. That's basically uh, stereo. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> but that's cool. I I'm actually glad to have it, despite of the shitty cover art. They should have just used this cover art instead, if you think about it. You know, just show the entire group uh, underneath... Um, this brighter lighter on um, near the uh, the cliffs here I mean that's what they could have chose or they could have just chose uh, the two posters which I know that was the case I mean there's a really cool poster where they show Severin who's already been shot and and his face is all uh, mutilated too because of the the climax of, well almost near climax scene where he gets uh, run over by a semi truck that's yeah, Caleb, who's played by Adrian Pastar, I run over. Yeah, and it's great to hear that this had a positive feedback from critics. I mean, for those who've seen the movie, because uh, sadly, uh, when this came out, yeah, it bombed poorly, and yeah, mostly because of um, the the mostly because it was released. Right in the middle of what would happen at this point, if, if you're in California, perhaps Southern California, this is at the time when we had a major earthquake, which was the Whittier earthquake, and then the stock market crash that happened in New York, and that was going on, and I, I'm not so sure if that was the cause of it, but if it was the case, then no wonder. And also because they didn't market the film very well either. And I think that's a shame, but luckily uh, people had discovered the film on home video. Yet had a long cable. HBO played the film, so it's great to see that for those who who had a chance to see it, I mean, they were lucky that they discovered a, a very small, underrated gem on, on their hands. So, anyway, but um, let's get to this review. It stars uh, Adrian Prestar, for those who don't know, uh, he was from the movie Top Gun, who played Chipper, and then later he went on to do um, other works in his career, like he was in that short-lived TV show uh, Profit, which was on Fox, uh, there was a DVD release of that, but it's been long out of print, um, but he was also in films like Claudio's Way, for Brian De Palma and had Al Pacino, uh, Mysterious Ways, and he also went on to do the voice of yeah, Tony Stark and AKA Iron Man in all the Marvel animated films uh, that were direct to video or have been released on other channels. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Hard to believe. <laughs> That's him. Jenny Wright, um, who, was, who made her debut with a film called The World According to Garp. Yeah, that was a film uh, that was based on a John Steinbeck, uh, John Steinbeck book uh, with Robin Williams playing the part. Uh, she was even in the movie Pink Floyd's The Wall, but then she went on to do a film called uh, 
uh, Out of Bounds uh, with um, Anthony Michael Hall and Jeff Kolper, you know, who later went on to do the film uh, The First Power, yeah. who played the, the Pantagram Killer. Um, she's a great actress. And she's, she's still around, but I think she's been moving on to something. Bill Paxton, of course, from The Terminator also. And he had appeared in Aliens. Yeah, where he says, Game over, man, game over. He was also in Twister, A Bright Shining Lie, A Simple Plan, Edge of Tomorrow. A lot of great films too, e even True Lies. And he's no longer with us, sadly. Lance Henderson, of course, from Aliens, uh, as well as Millennium, the TV series. He was also in The Terminator, and as well as Pumpkinhead, Hard Target, among many others. Legendary actor, and a great voice actor too. Jeanette Goldstein, I know she was in Aliens as well, but she was also in Terminator 2, playing the foster mother of John Connor. She's uh, been in other stuff too. Uh, Joshua John Miller, who happens to be the half-brother of actor Jason Patrick, which I know he was in The Lost Boys, as well as Rush, Speed 2 Cruise Control, Incognito, among others. I met the actor, by the way, uh, Jason Patrick. He's very good. He's great. Great actor. Uh, Marcy Lees, Tim Thomason, who was from the movie Trancers, but he was also in the film, which I do have on Blu ray, and I did the review too, at Cherry 2000. Yeah. Which was a good movie. Not great, but good. Uh, Troy Evans, uh, Roger Aaron Brown, James LaGrosse, Billy Beck, S.A. Griffin, Neff Hunter, and Teresa Rando. Yeah, because she was later went on to do films like Malcolm X. Yeah, Bad Boys. Yeah, he was. She was in that. Uh, she was also in Beverly Hills Cop Free, the worst sequel. Yeah, she was also in all the other Bad Boys films. So. Space Jam, among others. Yeah. It's written by Eric Red, who did, of course, the original Hitcher, among others, with Catherine Bigelow, who co wrote and directed the entire film. And of course, Catherine Bigelow, who went on to do big with films like the original Point Break, you know, with Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze. Uh, she later went on to do. Strange Days with Ray Fiennes. She also did K-19 The Widowmaker you know, with Harrison Ford and Liam Neeson. And of course, The Hurt Locker with Jeremy Renner. The movie begins in a very small town in Oklahoma. During that night, we meet a young man named Caleb Colton who's played by Adrian Pestar. Just drives around in a truck yeah, going to a local store to get something until he suddenly spotted a very young, attractive, beautiful, and pretty sexy drifter named May, who's played by Jenny Wright, who's just licking some ice cream from her ice cream cone, yeah, vanilla flavored. And since then, Caleb eventually fell in love with her, just wandering around at night, uh, driving around, and also showing Caleb her surprise and that turned out to be a horse which was frightened mostly because of her appearance I mean I guess because horses don't like her if that's the case well that's what's gonna lead to the particular twist was when what Caleb doesn't know was that she's actually a vampire and just before sunrise just when they're making love she became so frightened that she winds up biting him on the neck and runs off, you know, just in case. Um, and then when the rising sun appears, that's where uh, Caleb's fresh had begun to smoke and burn. 
Yeah, he was like trying to get all the way through his house. He was like walking around in the in the fields weekly, um, tr trying to get uh, trying to get home with his family. Um, the, his father is a farmer named Loy, who's played by Tim Thomason, and his younger sister Sarah, played by Marcy Leeds. Um, I'm assuming that uh, the father is a widower, because we never spotted uh, her, his wife. Because I know Lloyd, because even though Lloyd did have a daughter and a son. But I guess that's probably what, what it seems to be. Therefore, May arrives with a group of roaming nomadic vampires in an RV and takes them away right in front of them and that's where we meet a group of them that's that's like a family I mean first one is Severin who's played by Bill Paxson yeah the most psychotic one of them all but he does have some awesome one-liners and tremendous dialogue he was given so that's cool who actually wants to kill Caleb but may have revealed that he's already a vampire since he's been bitten uh, the charismatic leader is like a fodder figure type named Jesse Hooker, who's played by Lance Henderson. He's the leader of the pack, um, who reluctantly agrees. He's joined by um, his sexy, tough chick um, girlfriend named Diamondback, who's played by Jeanette Goldstein. And we have a childlike vampire who might as well just be underneath it at all he may be a kid but he's actually one of the oldest uh, vampires of them all yeah and that kind of led to the joke here too named Homer who's played by Joshua John Miller so. since then um, they allow Caleb to remain with them for a week so they can see if they can teach him how to hunt and gains their group's trust you know just going around um, Hunting their preys, you know, just going around killing all the all these uh, locals out there, you know, eating their flesh, so that way they'll get more blood and they'll stay alive for a long time. But Caleb doesn't want to be part of it, so he just wants to go back home. But suddenly, he started feeling very weak. I mean, through his stomach, knowing that he's actually hungry for for blood. But he had to go all the way um, just to take a bus. And once he was in the streets, you probably noticed that it's actually Huntington Beach in California. Uh, that's where you spotted the, the Warner feeder where it was playing the, the movie Aliens. Yeah, here's the connection right there. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, he had $11. Um, he had to pay the fare for 14 um, he was trying to talk him down for the cop who just discovered him thinking that he's like he might have been drugged or something but he's not and he was just already having like a candy bar orbit but uh, because of his um, change of taste buds here yeah he just spit it out um, the cop did gave him uh, free bucks left so that way he can finally take the bus all the way home but eventually it winds up going to the same spot where May suddenly waited for him to join and now he finally joined the group to actually go around hunting and all. Uh, they even destroy the RV uh, just so they could take out and steal a, uh, a big tr a big truck uh, filled with all the families around so that way they can go around you know staying in at several places that they choose like a local motel and all. And at that point on, they, they also went to a local bar, too, where they had to go around, you know, killing all these uh, bikers around, or pretty much all these other local ones, uh, which is so fun, too. It's like, it's like you just see uh, Severin just going around, you know, just grabbing a drink, you know, having, like, all of these hot shots, then spits it onto that other guy and just... <laughs> And then later, 
starts going around, you know, killing all the other ones too. Um, Elsa later, you know, slashes the the bartender. Says he had a gun, and he shot uh, Caleb uh, in the abs. You know, all the blood's coming out, which I know at that point on he Caleb actually punched the the guy right next to him, even though the guy did punch Tim and Seven just. <laughs> You know, just hold him in, just act like he was going to get punched, and all the blood comes out of his lips, and all. Um, then, of course, um, a waitress came by, um, since uh, uh, Jesse was ordering some beer on a glass, or at this rate, beer for uh, Diamondback, but uh, Jesse just wants the glass, so that way, you know, Diamondback's going to slit her throat you know, with the knife and that's where it's going to pour all that blood into the glass and he'll be able to drink it too yeah Homer's just like dancing around you know doing all that so yeah they did kill these guys um, only to spare one guy who uh, eventually they wanted um, well May just actually had him you know dancing with the guy and then he was about to run away just so, so that way Caleb would actually attack him. But he jumped out of the window. Um, he was running as fast as he can just to do that, but he decided to spare his life and just have him run. So afterwards, they destroyed the entire local bar. And by the way, the local bar was, of course, playing the song by John Parr, you know, Naughty Naughty, and they played random songs too. Before uh, sunrise was hitting, they they uh, took a spot at a local motel to rent all these bungalows that they had to choose um, just to stay in. But then s daylight started to appear, and then all of a sudden, a bunch of state troopers came by because uh, the same guy from the local bar just called them out and was ready to attack them, you know, shooting, just shooting them all. Uh, joining in with the group, uh, they had this. The, there was like a a battle between them and the and the state troopers. You know, shooting them all down, killing them here and there. And of course, Severn got his face burned from opening the the window that they had to cover from the draperies and everything. So they shot them down, and Caleb had to cover himself. Um, uh, with the sheets, so that way, you know, he can avoid getting burned, but he's being shot down by this one state trooper uh, in the leg and in the back, and he was trying to make it straight into uh, the band, yeah, the black band, uh, the ethno band, so that way they can make it, um, joining with the rest of the group, so they can drive off to the next motel. Uh, meanwhile, uh, both Loy and Sarah were just running around to several places trying to find Caleb. They had to call the cops to, to trace him down. And next thing you know, by the time the group, along with Caleb and May, had to stay at a local motel, next thing you know, Homer came outside and spotted uh, Sarah, you know, just grabbing a Coke. And decided to tell him to decided to tell her to you know go inside to the hotel room that they're staying in and and watch TV while um, both uh, Jesse and Severn were just you know setting up all the the bullets uh, for their guns and they're playing poker uh, joining them with uh, Diamondback um, and then uh, Lloyd just appears. Um, well, of course, Caleb already spotting the uh, Sarah, and then that's where it led to this conversation here, where now, um, of course, um, Caleb was about to leave as fast as he can with Loy and um, Sarah, because they're about to take her. Um, Loy was about to shoot uh, Jesse, only shot him in almost near the chest, he spits out the bullet, put it inside his pocket, 
and then was ready to break his hand and then you know Caleb actually opens the door or I think it was May too yeah I think they both opened or uh, no actually it was Sarah and then, and then Sarah opens the door and then they about to flee as fast as they can but of course already being covered uh, with the sheets yeah you can see uh, Caleb already burning and this is where it leads to this particular twist too or perhaps a cop out that's okay because I think that's how they were going to go for was where he had to take a blood transfusion so you know through um, Lloyd's blood so that way he'll be back to normal it's no longer a vampire and it worked it only took him like a full recovery for like maybe the following day or so and now uh, he was back to normal he was just hanging around with the family again until the next night he spotted the uh, May and now you know just because they just missed her for a while and hoping he'll be able to see her again but then to make matters worse they kidnapped Sarah and that's where it led to the final showdown where we had Severin and we had uh, Caleb who was trying to find Sarah he was, he was riding around in a horse which he got uh, thrown off and then later uh, the the semi uh, trucker came by uh, yeah he was about to he's about to take the truck tell him to get off and then but then the driver uh, got shot in the head yeah bullseye from Severin and then well Caleb took over uh, because before this whole thing happened I mean he did rode around on a truck uh, with this black uh, truck driver and he actually learns all the the skills of being a, a truck driver and, and everything so he definitely remembers uh, when he was with uh, May and I know at that point on uh, May actually uh, ate his flesh you know, for his neck and that's where he started drinking all the blood and at that point on yes uh, uh, Caleb also started drinking blood from uh, May's um, risk but if you drink too much of it <laughs> she won't be able to live longer anyway but getting back to that that's where we had the climax where he's about to run over Severin straight into the semi crashes straight into him and then somehow his his entire face was all smashed up all mutilated with blood and and this is where he goes around saying Fasten your fucking seatbelt. <laughs> and then he goes around ripping all the parts uh, from the truck. Then Caleb just hits uh, release and eject. He escaped from that truck. And then next thing you know, the truck explodes. And he dies. And then we led to the, the next showdown with Jesse and Diamondback. Yeah, with Homer already in the back of the, the car which happens to be a station wagon and already um, Homer was ready to actually uh, eat Sarah's flesh but actually knocks him out with the gun and was about to escape but that's of course what let but then it just continues once uh, she ran away and they just came back and they just grab her ex with uh, Caleb running as fast as he can um, to get her but he was getting pretty weaker at this point he was getting tired and, and then now they took uh, Sarah once again which would lead to by the time sunrise was appearing and then and already they're covering the entire uh, windows you know with foil and all so they don't get burned and they were doing that every time they when sunlight appears, you know they cover all all the window shields, uh, all the windshields and and the windows and all, so they don't get burned. Um, therefore, Sarah finally escapes out of there uh, with May, because May just jumped out of the the windshield and about to escape in, in slow motion, and Homer was about to go after them, and then 
Homer was on fire with all the burns appearing, all the, the roasts roasting through the sunlight, and somehow he explodes. And then both uh, Jesse and Diamondback were about to chase after them as they continue, but then, of course, even though they were trying to cover themselves, and they try to look straight to the windshield, they know that they're already roasting already, and, and eventually they're going to die too. So they explode with the station wagon, and now they're gone. Finally. So now, um, Caleb decided to use blood transfusion from his blood to uh, May. So now she can be as normal as ever, and the two just hit it off. Fell in love. So now she'll be able to see the sunlight forever. Same goes with Caleb. <laughs> yeah. Awesome movie. Uh, well done, well made for its small budgets. It really works. Love the cast and characters that they portrayed. Um, it definitely blends in with not only as an actual horror vampire film, but it's also a western, you know, like any other westerns you see. And that to me really works. You notice how the characters themselves, they don't. Uh, have all these fangs when, whenever they started buying their flesh. They just had normal teeth. But they do tend to get sharper nails though. Trying to almost look exactly like something that you see on most vampire movies or or the mythology of them all. But it just blends so well and and given the the benefit of the doubt here, I thought Catherine Bigelow really did an amazing job filming this movie. Even though originally she wanted to just film most of it in daylight, but the rest of the film is supposed to be set at night anyway, because that's how the film tells the story. And the story really um, is very incredible. Best of all, it has more fun, high energy, without anything boring. I mean, through its particular runtime. And the runtime was actually 95 minutes. Um, I don't know how it did it got the 99 minute uh, mark on on the Blu-ray as advertised, but I guess maybe there could have been some more scenes included, but sadly it wasn't. Yeah, maybe it's it's an error. And I just love it so much. Um, they had some great action in this movie too. I mean, maybe there could have been more, but that's the whole point of this of this story. Um, the love scenes were were exactly what love scenes are supposed to be. It works. Not your typical uh, teenage love scenes that you often see in that stupid Twilight movies. Yeah, your typical garbage ones. No, this one is done exactly right. I mean, they're already in their younger age anyway. Basically, I mean, they're in their early 20s. So at this point on, I think they really maintained it very well. So they're all adults here. Uh, with Joshua John Miller being the kid, but still. <laughs> um, yes, they do smoke and they do everything they can. Uh, the score was done by Tantrian Dream. And let's face it, any movie, even if it's the 80s though, you're going to always hear that particular soothing theme by Tantrian Dream. Because um, they were, yeah, Tantrian Dream, of course, is a German electric music band. That was by Edgar uh, Frosty, and of course, up until his death, I mean, he's done a lot of great scores from several movies that you're familiar with, and it just gives it that rousing synthesizer score that's so beautiful, it can be dreamy. It's like, damn, you, you feel like you're in a fantasy every time you hear that score. And it does have created a lot of great beats, even the ones that are so dramatic, it really blends in so well. I love it. And uh, the writing is just incredibly solid. You know, both done by Eric Red and Catherine Bigelow. They really know what they were doing. I mean, it almost felt like something that Jim Cameron could have done, James Cameron. And I, I would have loved that too. I, imagine if that actually happened. Um, and um, but it does have some nice, great songs too. 
um, to join in. Um, definitely was a perfect choice to, to go for the trend of vampire films, even in the late 80s. I mean, with Fright Night and The Lost Boys come to mind. Um, same goes with BAMP, uh, with uh, Grace Jones. Um, it's it, it's definitely the perfect film to, to really enjoy. Um, I love how they they even focus on the characters' traits too, where we begin to find out about those the characters. You know, like f for example, Jesse and um, even Severin actually started uh, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So they so it turns out that yes, they were a lot older than everyone else around. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they really lived this long, you know, having to go around hunting and killing all these victims, you know, for blood. And all. And I, I just love how they we get to see how we have a child actor who isn't annoying, but I think he was just just great when he does it. And, and by the way, uh, I know uh, Joshua John Miller was in a movie called uh, *River's Edge*, yeah, you know, which had an ensemble cast too, and which almost plays something similar to what Twin Peaks was doing at the time. You know, going for the autopsy of a young teenage girl who was killed and was dumped somewhere in the river that they found, and they're trying to find out who's the suspect. One of those whodunit stories, um, but it really works here. Uh, but his performance is just um, incredible, too. And I can see that. Uh, but it, again, everyone else was great. I mean, Adrian Prestar, I think he really nailed it. I mean, he is a young star at the time. He was perfect, even though originally he didn't want to do it at first until he read the script. Uh, I know Bill Paxton, God vs. So, I mean, he read the script hoping that this was not going to be one of your typical vampire flicks that's going for the gothic style or whatever, but he was so impressed with it that that he showed it to Lance and and they all loved it and, and they were like, even though he wasn't thrilled by it at first, but they were all <laughs> glancing around and, and, and they just felt like, man, they, they had to do this. And they were lucky. And same goes with Jeanette Goldstein too. So I'm glad the, the free... Uh, team from Aliens finally get to join in to do a small film. Um, and Jenny Wright, I mean, she's very beautiful, too. And rightly so. I mean, I, I love the chemistry between Pastar and Wright. They really hit it off. It really shows exactly how we care for. I mean, we know that they're not stalkers or anything like that. No, they're just incredibly sweet, innocent type of people that we want to get to know better and care for them. And yes, the good thing is though, I'm glad the vampires do not sparkle. No, they actually burn. Because <laughs> we all know the mythology of vampires. The weakness is is sunlight. So that means they're going to start burning until they explode or disappear. You know, vaporize. So yeah. They did it exactly right for that particular budget. The special effects, of course, was done by Fantasy II. Um, of course, they had used a lot of prosthetics, you know, creating the burn scenes, uh, putting all the burn makeup and all. And the fact that they had to use cigarette burns, uh, yeah, all the cigarettes that they had to use to put it underneath it all. And then they had blood scribs that they had to wear and all. I mean. And the way they did it, though, I mean, they tend to smell more like cigarettes. Like, they they, they smoke <laughs> completely. I bet it was so nasty, I can see why. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very found by that either, but, you know, all that vapor. Um, but it's cool. Um, incredible. So anyway, um, excellent movie, Near Dark. Check it out. So that's the my review of Near Dark, and I give the film five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.